the Great Pyramids and their relationship to the River Nile reflect the sky of 12,500 years ago. I mean, it's just crazy. We've talked about, you know, alternative theories to how it was, how the pyramids were built. Yeah. yeah. I'm willing to accept that the Great Pyramid was largely completed by the ancient Egyptians. But remember that the ancient Egyptians tell us in many of their texts that everything they knew was a legacy. The sand dunes of the Sahara have been hiding a secret for thousands of years, which could change history as we know it. Within its depths lies a lost civilization whose history is often overlooked and overshadowed by the allure of ancient Egypt, Nubia, a society as advanced as many of its contemporaries, with structures, art, and a culture that has endured since prehistoric times. Nubia is now coming into its own and is being understood to be of equal importance. It is different from ancient Egypt, but it is equally important and not just an adjunct to this Egyptian culture. But with very little known about its dark origins, its history remains mysterious. Travel with us back in time as we explore the lost history of Nubia, Africa's forgotten civilization, the forgotten people, Lost in the dry and desolate deserts of Egypt and Sudan are remnants of an ancient civilization whose history has almost been swept away by the passage of time. This is Nubia, the site of Africa's earliest advanced societies, sitting along the Nile River, with a history intertwined with ancient Egypt and the Roman Empire. The story of this ancient culture dates back to around 5000 BC, when the first Africans began moving from the Sahara towards the Nile. These hunter-gatherer communities possessed remarkable pottery skills, creating artifacts and relics that were coated with ochre or decorated with puncture designs. Afid 23, an archaeological site located in the Afid region of southern Dongola Reach in northern Sudan, has produced numerous evidence of their existence. This includes well-preserved remains of their prehistoric camps, relics of open-air huts, and a community that could be about 50,000 years old. After settling beside the Nile, these ancient tribes soon turned to fishing as a source of livelihood, but as the transformative days of the Neolithic Revolution swept in, their lifestyle changed from hunter-gatherers to farmers. Banking on the nourishment brought by the Nile, the ancient Nubians began growing grains, peas, lentils, dates, and possibly melons, and their small camps grew into small villages and permanent settlements. It was also around this time that the culture of cattle herding emerged from this ancient society as they ventured into the domestication of animals for food and commerce. As recorded in their oral history, owning herds of cattle was considered a measure of wealth and social status back in the day, and the culture still remains etched in the identities of the surviving descendants of the ancient Nubians today. In the depths of the deserts, the Nubians also mined carnelian and gold, as well as other mineral resources, and their trade was done by bartering cattle, gold, ivory, animal skins, hardwood, incense, and dates. Within a matter of years, what started as a small settlement soon grew into a whole kingdom, a kingdom whose remnants have been buried in the sand for centuries, brick by brick, the story of Kerma. When archeologists first excavated the ancient city of Kerma in 1913, they initially classified it as a fort for an Egyptian governor, which evolved into its own independent territory. However, deeper studies showcased a different culture that was slightly similar but considerably different from the ancient Egyptians. It was G.A. Reisner who directed the Harvard-Boston expedition that mapped much of the city and unearthed countless artifacts at this site, and it felt like locating a lost book containing the history of a forgotten people. The site, located upstream of the third cataract of the Nile River, is believed to be one of the earliest African kingdoms, identified in the Egyptian text from the Middle Kingdom with a whole different name, Kush. But before that massive kingdom that eventually dominated Egypt emerged, Kerma was a strategic Nubian community recognized for its strategic position on several caravan routes, through which traders and travelers could access the Red Sea, Egypt, the Horn of Africa, and what's now known as Sub-Saharan Africa. Digging deep into the history of the Kerma culture, archaeologists uncovered four distinct phases, which span from the end of the Old Kingdom to the transitional phase between the Second Intermediate Period and the New Kingdom. Judging by the burial rites of the ancient Nubians who called it home, the morphology of the tomb left behind, and the type of ceramics found there. It was obvious this wasn't just an extension of Egypt. Back when the desert sun smiled down on this ancient African civilization, it boasted a large walled metropolis, 
with a population of about 10,000 inhabitants, although some historians claim there were only 2,000 Nubians living there at the time. As one of the earliest civilizations with its own technology, Kerma consisted of a system of planned roads connecting the residential areas and the necropolis as well as a religious quarter to a massive adobe structure known as the Defufa. Between 2500 BC and 1500 BC, the Kerma kingdom thrived, and although it was mainly based in Upper Nubia, it would later extend into Lower Nubia, and even to the gates of Egypt itself. During this period, Egyptians and Nubians lived side by side, trading cattle, gold, ivory, and other commodities. Historians also divide the development of the Nubian communities into five periods, aligning with the events that punctuated those times. There was the pre-Kerma era from 3500 to 2500 BC, where the region was dominated by small separate farming and fishing settlements. There was the early Kerma period, between 2500 to 2050 BC, when these villages started banding together to establish one solid civilization. There was the Middle Kerma period from 2050 and 1750 BC, the Classic Kerma era from 1750 to 1580 BC, and the Late Kerma from 1500 to 1100 BC. But Kerma wasn't the only Nubian city thriving around the Nile River. There was also Napata and Mero, which were large population centers with rich agricultural lands. However, it didn't take long for the ancient Egyptian rulers to take an interest in the immeasurable wealth of the Nubians, hoping to have it all for themselves. Soon, a domination plan was set in motion, interlinking Nubian history with the Egyptians forever. Nubian in Egypt. The gold mines within their territories, the invaluable lands that could bolster the Egyptian economy, and the all-important trade routes of the Nile caught the eye of the ancient Egyptians, and so the plan to dominate the Nubian cities was set into motion. This wasn't the first time Egypt would be conquering Nubia though. Earlier in 1950 BC, Pharaoh Senesrit I and the other kings of the 12th dynasty were also drawn by the wealth of the black community, and subsequently invaded Lower Nubia, again and again. However, this power would only last for about two centuries. As Egypt's 13th dynasty rolled in between 1780 BC and 1660 BC, Egypt lost control of the area again, and the Nubians regained their independence, although several clashes still occurred. The Middle Kingdom of Egypt existed side by side with Kerma, with each civilization erecting its borders near Semna, close to the Second Cataract. Throughout this period, Egypt kept its eyes away from Upper Nubia, and it was gradually reintroduced as Egypt's prosperous southern neighbor, famously known as Kush. This name would remain in use for a very long time, and even made several appearances in biblical accounts. Then the Second Intermediate Period rolled in, and Upper Egypt came under the rule of the 17th Dynasty, succeeding the 13th Dynasty, while Lower Egypt was ruled by the 14th, 15th, and 16th Dynasties. Since they engaged in trades and needed to get along, the kings of Kerma exchanged diplomats with the northern kings, and their relationship was somewhat cordial for hundreds of years. Everything changed when Amos, the first king of the 18th dynasty, reunited Upper and Lower Egypt under one rulership, and launched an unprecedented war against the Hyksos kingdom, good allies of the Nubians. The Nubians, who were considered strategic neighbors, quickly became a target. It didn't take long for Amos to invade the cities, starting from Lower Nubia, and then working his way up to the second cataract up to Semna. Of course, Nubia wasn't a weak nation that could simply be trampled underfoot by the ancient Egyptians, and so the invasion was met with fierce opposition. But the invaders were relentless, and fought valiantly to possess the lands, pushing the Nubians deeper and deeper into servitude. Amos wasn't able to see the end of the war, but his successors carried on the legacy, conquering Nubia up to the Fourth Cataract. After bringing the ancient African Empire to its knees, the Egyptians held control over the holy mountain of Nubia the Gebel Barkal situated near Napata. It was here that Thutmose III, ruler of Egypt between 1479 and 1425 BC, created a residence for the Viceroy, his representative who was collectively known as King's Son of Kush. The Viceroy extended Thutmose's rule from the thrones of Egypt to the land of the Nubians, who were forced to pay homage to the kingdom they once considered equals, or at least contemporaries. While pockets of violence erupted, and rebellions arose from time to time, the three parts of Nubia were mostly subdued and annexed as provinces of the new kingdom, giving Egypt control over the southern trade roads. With Nubia conquered, the monopoly Egypt sought was finally theirs, bringing untold wealth and prosperity to the ancient civilization and a gradual decline in the Nubian economy. 
But not only did this ancient African civilization lose their lands, their mines, and their farmlands, but they also began to lose their identities. With the Egyptians as their overlords, Nubia's culture started to melt into the Pharaonic culture. They built pyramids, scribbled down hieroglyphic writings, and worshipped the Egyptian gods. Since the Nubians had no written language before their takeover, their history was not told with their own voices, but was only recovered through Egyptian writings, which means the bulk of their stories were either completely lost or significantly underrecorded. With the Nubians subdued, the Egyptians became the primary source of gold in the Middle East. And with Nubian slaves working the mines, Egypt became increasingly prosperous from plundering the riches of the Nubian lands. Diodorus Siculus, an ancient historian, recorded detailed accounts of the primitive working conditions the slaves were subjected to, and it definitely wasn't glamorous. In addition, the Turin Papyrus map, one of the oldest maps known to mankind, dated to about 1160 BC, captured one of the earliest roadmaps in existence, and it provided direction for miners extracting the wealth of the earth in Nubian territories. The Nubians weren't just slaves though, as some scholars believe they became included in the 18th dynasty of Egypt's royal family. A good example is Amosinefertari, who's often referred to as the most venerated woman in Egyptian history, and whose lineage can be traced back to the land of Nubia. Historical accounts often depict her with black skin, and the mummified remains of her father, Sikwenenre Tao, has also been described as having tightly curled woolly hair with a slight build and strongly Nubian features. With this genealogy confirmed, it means the Nubians were not just servants, slaves, and lesser beings to the Egyptians, but the two tribes likely intermarried and had children of both Nubian and Egyptian ancestry. However, other scholars argue that Ahmose Nefertari's dark skin depiction is only indicative of her role as the goddess of resurrection, since black was considered the color of the underworld. As it is in every conquered land, some citizens took their stand and refused to be transformed into simple black Egyptians. Several Nubian traditions endured through this period, preserved by those committed to maintaining the true identity of the conquered people. For 500 years, Nubia was a colony of Egypt, up until the reign of Rameses XI came to an end. As the last king of the 20th dynasty gave way for a new ruler, Nubia finally regained its independence, establishing a new capital in Napata. From here on, the tide shifted, and the kingdom of Kush began its ascent into becoming a domineering world power. The 25th dynasty, and the Black Pharaohs. In the pages of Egyptian history, stories from the 25th dynasty are often overlooked, majorly because it represents a dark chapter in Egyptian history, where the dominant empire became subjected to the rule of the people they once ruled over. This chapter in Egypt's history began with one man, an ancient Nubian ruler known as Piye or Pianki. History records that during the reign of this brave leader and warrior, the Nubian Empire had grown into a strong and formidable force, unlike the subservient territory that it used to be. But Paye harbored dreams of domination, which involved bringing Egypt, their former captor, under Nubian rule. After years of careful planning, Paye personally led a massive attack on Egypt, invading its defensive walls and conquering its soldiers with unprecedented force. Stories of this epic war are documented in a lengthy hieroglyphic-filled stele called the Stele of Victory which announced Piye as pharaoh of all Egypt. Taking a page from the Book of Egyptian Mythology, Piye also pronounced himself a divine ruler, under the new names Son of Re, or ruler of Lower Egypt, and Beloved of Amun, or ruler of Upper Egypt. His dream wasn't just to bring a section of the nation under himself, but to take it wholly, achieving the double kingship that generations of Kushites could only dream of. He was described as the culmination of Kushite ambition, political skill, and the Theban decision to reunify Egypt in this particular way. His reign, however, was more focused on restructuring the ancient land rather than bringing it under servitude. While many historical accounts fail to record Paye as ruler of Egypt, other mainstream Egyptologists consider him the first pharaoh of the 25th dynasty, and the black roots of Egypt are often traced right back to him. Going by the description given by the stele of Paye, the pharaoh is described as religious, compassionate, and a lover of horses. Although conquered and subjected to Nubian rule, the 25th dynasty still maintained its Egyptian identity. The language and writing system was retained, the religious traditions remained the same, and the literary traditions were untouched throughout the era. So, during his time, the lost art of pyramid construction, which had become obsolete after the Old and Middle Kingdoms rolled by, regained prominence. Known to be an energetic builder himself, Paye oversaw the construction of the oldest known pyramid at the royal burial site of El Kuru, 
and also expanded the Temple of Amun at Jebel Barkal, adding an immense colonnaded forecourt. As Egypt's black pharaoh, Pa attempted to extend the empire's influence into the Near East, which was then under the rulership of the Semitic Neo-Assyrian Empire, controlled by proxy from Mesopotamia. In the year 720 BC, the pharaoh sent an army to support a rebellious uprising against the kingdom of Assyria in Philistia and Gaza, but even with his highly trained soldiers, Sargon II of Assyria and Sennacherib won the war, quelling the rebellion with a heavy hand. This defeat exposed a weakness in the Nubian Egyptian government, and would eventually lead to the empire's downfall. After Sargon II and Sennacherib were succeeded by Esarhaddon and Ashurbanipal, the two began planning an invasion, which culminated in the historical Assyrian conquest of Egypt and the fall of the 25th dynasty. Broken and battered by the brute force the Assyrians brought into battle, the Nubians faced devastating defeat, driving them out of the territory they ruled for over 100 years. The remnants of their era could still be found in the arid desert, painting a picture of the glorious kingdom there once was. Ruins of ages past, dusts of the Nubian Empire. Today, the modern Nubian town of Kerma sits at the northern end of the Nile's Great Bend, a bustling riverside town teeming with produce markets and stockpiled fishing boats. Exploring this town is like going through a time capsule that'll transport you thousands of years into the times of the great Nubian kings. In the middle of this town, you'll find a five-story mud brick tower, locally known as the Defufa. Standing for more than 4,000 years, this ancient structure consists of multiple levels, an interior staircase leading to a rooftop platform, and a series of subterranean chambers. When this structure was first built, around 2500 BC, Kerma was simply an island in the middle of the Nile, and the earliest urban center in Africa outside of Egypt. Historians believe the name Defufa was either derived from the Nubian word for a mud-brick building, or from the Arabic word Dufa, meaning pile. Measuring 59 feet tall, with decorated passageways, paintings, and a shrine, this massive structure is often classified as the perfect example of Nubian architecture. Back in the day, the Defufa served as a temple and religious center of the city, with a limestone altar where animals were likely sacrificed. Also located 1.2 miles away from this particular structure, lies what remains of the Eastern Defufa, which historians believe was used as a funerary chapel and burial ground in ancient times. For five decades, archaeologists Charles Bonnet of the University of Geneva has been excavating the ancient city of Kerma and its necropolis, uncovering the lost artifacts and the secrets tucked away in the ancient ruins. Bonnet's exploration of the site began in 1976, about 50 years after renowned Egyptologist George Reisner closed his excavations. As the leader of a joint expedition between Harvard University and the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, Reisner directed several expeditions at the Great Pyramid of Giza, as well as other sites in southern Egypt. While there, he developed an interest in the ancient Nubian culture which wasn't getting as much attention as its Egyptian counterpart. So in 1913, Reisner accepted the request of the Sudanese Antiquity Center in Khartoum to explore Kerma, but nothing could have prepared him and his team for the incredible discoveries they were about to make. The scientists discovered a lost civilization buried in the desert, with no record of existence. Delving deep into the ancient landscape, Reisner and his team began investigating dozens of massive toma in the city's necropolis, located some two miles to the east. There they found dozens of royal tombs, dating back between 1750 and 1500 BC, when the city of Kerma was still a force to be reckoned with in the ancient world. Within these ruins, the archaeologists also uncovered remains of human and animal sacrifices in their hundreds, revealing the gruesome practices that were considered normal in those times. The burial site also contained precious jewelry made from quartz, gold, amethyst, and wooden funerary bed decorated with scenes of African wildlife crafted from ivory and mica. Of the many tombs uncovered in this ancient necropolis, one of the most notable belonged to the prominent Egyptian governor Jefai Hapi, ruler of the ancient district north of Luxor between 1971 and 1926 BC. Not far from this spot, Raisper located a broken bust believed to be from Jefai Hapi himself confirming that this was indeed the resting place of the Nubian elites. Owing to the complexity of the structures he observed at the sites, and the obvious distinction between them and the Egyptian landmarks, Reisner concluded that the Nubians couldn't have been responsible for crafting such masterpieces. As a matter of fact, he concluded that the Defufa was most likely built for and occupied by the Egyptian governors overseeing the region, and that the Nubian structures were built by ancient Egyptian engineers, or at least with their help. But as wild as his assertions were, 
Reisner wasn't alone in this thinking, as most scholars of his area couldn't believe that an indigenous African civilization could rival the magnificent ancient Egypt in size, sophistication, and technology. They couldn't be more wrong. As Charles Bonnet began excavation works at Kerma, his team located 30,000 more burial sites than what Reisner found, making it one of the largest and most expensive cemeteries ever found. As they dug deeper and deeper, they found pottery dating back to 1500 BC, the time when the Egyptians invaded and took control of Nubia. And they came to realize that Kerma wasn't built by Egyptians, but had been constructed and inhabited by the ancient Nubian civilization before the Egyptians ever came. Through Bonnet's in-depth research, archaeologists finally rewrote the narrative that the Nubians depended on Egypt, while identifying several other pieces of African culture at Kerma. They found round huts, intricate curved wall bastions and oval temples that differed from the typical sites of ancient Egypt, and bore similarities to the buildings unearthed in southern Sudan and other regions of central Africa. It was like stumbling into a whole new world, completely rewriting the history of the lost world. Before we go on with the rest of the video, here's our subscribers pick for today. The desert regions of Africa hide many secrets that have been hidden for centuries. Lost stories, forgotten tribes, and artifacts buried deep within the sand dunes. Just recently, scientists discovered a lost civilization buried in the desert. No record of it exists, and it could change the history of ancient Egypt as we know it. Since archaeologists first started exploring the ruins of ancient Egypt, it has become known as one of the most advanced ancient civilizations. But what most people don't realize is that another equally advanced community existed right beside Egypt, known as the Kingdom of Nubia. Also known as the Black Pharaohs of Egypt, this ancient tribe once conquered the ancient Egyptians, ruling over them for many, many years. But their stories have gone untold for hundreds of years since they vanished off the face of the earth. How did historians manage to remain oblivious to the existence of Africa's oldest civilization while conducting intense study on their next door neighbor? And why did the ruins of Nubia almost disappear from the pages of history? Share your thoughts with us in the comments down below. Now, let's get back to the video. The Pyramids of Nubia. Egypt is famous for many things, but for most people, the towering pyramids remain the most alluring sights in the ancient city. But what most people don't realize is that there are way more Nubian pyramids than Egyptian versions. To put that into perspective, Egypt has about 200 pyramids within its territory, while Kushite pyramids number around 2,000, although they differ in stature and build. To crown it all, most Nubian pyramids were built earlier than the Egyptian versions, and it's already a well-known historical fact that Kerma was among the first ancient civilizations to embrace unique burial architecture. Of the many pyramids situated in this ancient landscape, the most extensive of them all is known as Meroe, home to over 40 Nubian kings and queens. Located in the ancient city of Meroe, this group of pyramids served as the final resting place for Nubian royals for years, as well as a few other instances where non-royals were also buried there. The tomb walls depict mummified royals draped in jewelry, with their wooden caskets containing bows, quivers of arrows, horse harnesses, pottery, rings, along with glass and metal artifacts. There were more pyramids standing at this site prior to the 1830s, but 40 of them fell after a treasure hunter named Giuseppe Ferlini set his sights on capturing the treasure hidden within. Convinced that the most intact pyramids held the best treasures, Ferlini raided and demolished these ancient burial sites and carted away droves of Nubian artifacts hoping to make a fortune. Unfortunately for him though, after getting back to his homeland and trying to sell the treasures, nobody believed that such high-quality jewelry could have been made in Africa, so they didn't buy it. As of today, much of this treasure can be found in the State Museum of Egyptian Art in Munich, while the rest are stored at the Egyptian Museum of Berlin. Ancient Church of Nubia As archaeologists continued excavations in Old Dongola, northern Sudan, they suddenly stumbled on two walls of a 19-foot-wide apse, as well as the dome of what appears to be a large tomb. The expedition that uncovered this fascinating find was led by a man named Artur Obluski from the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology at the University of Warsaw. According to Obluski, he and his team were exploring the region using remote sensing techniques, when they noted an empty space in the center of the ancient town. Curious as to what could be hidden beneath the dirt, the team proceeded with a massive excavation operation, hoping to maybe find a town square probably used for communal prayers. But nothing could have prepared them for the massive medieval cathedral they uncovered, which, according to historians, could have served as the seat of power for archbishops in the Nubian kingdom of Makuria, where Christianity got a foothold in the mid-6th century. As they continued their excavation, and the two walls became more visible, 
they noticed it was decorated with remarkable paintings depicting monumental figures. Judging by what's left of the building, it appears to have been up to 85 feet wide and as tall as a three-story block of flats. While the discovery of the church was pretty unbelievable, archaeologists were even more shocked at finding a tomb close to the ruins. With much of the Nubian history undocumented, historians could only resort to bits and pieces of hints and clues to determine who built these structures and what functions they were meant for. After careful study, researchers suggested that the Dongola tomb was most likely owned by an archbishop, although the exact church leader has still not been confirmed. According to recorded history, Dongola functioned as a major Christian center until around the 14th century, when forces from Egypt and the Middle East began proliferating the message of Islam and gradually transformed the region into a predominantly Muslim state. Today, the descendants of this ancient civilization also still live within the regions inhabited by their ancestors a place now known as Old Nubia, located in modern Egypt and Sudan. Although their ancestral land has been threatened by natural disasters a couple of times, they remain rooted in their ancestral land, and their stories will captivate the world for generations to come. Thank you for watching this video. See you in the next one.